we can, we can demonstrate that the traditions that Bukhari gives us were well known even outside the Islamic community. One of the earliest writers against Islam as a Christian was named Al-Kindi. And around the time of 820 AD or so, he has an exchange, a written exchange with, uh, with a, a Muslim. And the result is one of the most insightful encounters that we have. It's extremely important for us to look at this kind of information. Here's what he writes to his Islamic friend on this subject. And notice the parallels to Bukhari. The result was that in the Caliphate of Uthman, it was discovered there was no consent to the true text. One man then read one version of the Quran, his neighbor another, and they differed. One man said to his neighbor, my text is better than yours, while his neighbor defended his own. So additions and losses came about and falsification of the text. Uthman was told that various versions were in use, that the text was being tampered with, and that strife with all the mischief of party spirit was being engendered. They said, we do not believe that matters can continue as they are. It is an affair of urgency. They are slaying one another. The sacred book is corrupted. A second apostasy is imminent. So there is great concern, just as Bukhari says, great concern that we don't want to be like the Jews and the Christians. Uthman did not burn anyone for keeping extra books. He didn't punish anyone. All of these claims were made in the air. Quoting who? Al-Kindi. Did you remember that? Do you, do you remember who? Did, you, did James tell you who Al-Kindi is? Did he tell you? Yes. I, don't, I don't remember hearing that. Al-Kindi was a Christian polemicist <laughs> writing in the ninth century. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, please. Al-Kindi, wait. Okay, okay, I didn't hear it. I didn't hear it. Okay, it's, record it's being recorded. Uh, it's being recorded. Did I tell you who Al-Kindi was? I most certainly did. I told you when he lived. He was during the reign of the Caliph al-Mamun. He was a Christian in dialogue with a Muslim. I told you that. And how many of you wanted to go, talk beer? Because he says, because he didn't hear that. You weren't listening very well either, were you? <laughs> Ubay, the son of Kaab, was dead before it was made. While Ibn Masud refused to give up his copy of the Quran. Now remember, what did Muhammad say in the Hadith? If you want to know the Quran, he pointed to four people. What was one of them? Ibn Masud. Zayd bin Thabit was not one of them. And so I can imagine, if, if you've ever read any of the hadith that come from Ibn Masud, this guy, he was a man's man. You know, you know what I mean? I mean, this guy, he, was, he had a backbone. And I don't think he appreciated being left out of the, of the compilation of the Quran. Because Muhammad himself had said, this guy knows the Quran. And he was left out of it. So can you imagine if Uthman comes along, Muhammad hadn't said Uthman was the best, and Uthman comes along and says, give me your manuscript, I'm going to destroy it. Abdullah ibn Masud says, I don't think so. And in fact, because of that, his readings continue in the manuscript tradition for hundreds of years, especially in the Palimpsest manuscripts. So they drove him from his post in Kufa and appointed Abu Musa as governor in his place. In fact, some historical sources say he was beaten because he would not give up his mushaf. There's differences about that particular issue. When the revision had been completed according to the various manuscripts, four copies were made in large text, one of which was sent to Mecca, a second remained in Medina, a third was sent to Syria, and is today in Malatya. In fact, Al-Kindi goes through a whole story of what happened to each one. It's amazing the type of information that he had about this particular situation. When the uh, uh, next Uthman gave directions, the leaves and sheets of the Quran should be gathered in from the provinces. He ordered his agents to collect all that they could lay their hands on and destroy them till it should be certain that not a sheet remained in the possession of any private individual. That is the very definition of a controlled transmission. That's like the government come along and saying, we now have the official version of the Bible. Give us all yours. You can trust us. Sorry, I don't see Abdullah ibn Masud doing that. There are hadith where he tells the people of Kufa, don't give up your mushaf. There were divisions, there were differences. If it was all the same Quran with no differences, why are there these divisions? Interesting question. Heavy penalties were threatened against the disobedient. All the leaves they could secure were shredded and boiled in vinegar till they were sodden Nothing remained, not even the smallest fragment that could be deciphered. That is the Uthmanic revision.
Then he finally says to his, his, his Muslim friend, you know what happened between Ali, Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman? How they hated each other and quarreled and corrupted the text? How each one tried to oppose his neighbor and to refute what he had said? Pray, how are we to know which is the true text and how shall we distinguish it from the false one? And there's the question. Why is Ibn Masud wrong? Why, is, why are his readings? I mean, scholarly sources will tell you, for example, that in the tafsir of, uh, of Safiwan, Safian in uh, oh, it was, it was very early on, 67 places he mentions a difference in the razm, the actual reading of the text, and attributes them to Ibn Masud. And this is a fairly short tafsir. At that early period of time, they didn't have any problem talking about the fact that there were variations between Ibn Masud. Ubay ibn Qabz was pri primarily the same as Ibn Masud's, but there's some differences there. And now we have the Sa'ana palimpsests, which you just had up on the screen during your presentation, which gives us another reading outside of Abdullah ibn Masud. So we have textual variation. The question is, what are you going to do about it? Which methodology gives us the most certainty as to the real question? Do we possess the original words of the authors we believe to have been inspired of God? Now you can sit here and say, yes, because we have Isnad chains. And if that's good enough for you, I wasted my time for you. The question is, which methodology gives us the most certainty as to the real question? Do we possess the original words of the authors we believe to have been inspired of God? The free transmission of the New Testament text precludes the editing and revision that we just saw. The manuscript tradition shows us tenacity. The original readings still exist. No one could insert the deity of Christ in the text of the New Testament, take out some other doctrine, uh, put some denial of the resurrection or something. They could not do that. The transmission of the text could never allow that to happen. And it's because it was freely transmitted, widely transmitted from the very beginning. But the controlled transmission of the Quran, together with the Uthmanic revision, the possible later work of Abd al-Malik, which I haven't even gotten to this evening, and the evidence of the differing traditions of Ibn Masud, Ubay ibn Qab, and possibly others, the Sa'ana readings that we saw, raises serious questions as to the originality of the Uthmanic tradition. At the very least, what I've proven to you is that you have multiple traditions. You've got Uthman, you've got Ibn Masud, and you've got this other reading in Sa'ana, and you've got Ubay ibn Qab. You say, well, I like the one. Great, fine. Why? How do you know? What, what methodology have you used? And it's not chains aren't going to cut that for you, by the way. What methodology does your system provide you to know that that actually represents the original? That is the question for all of us this evening. Islamic scholars and apologists must recognize that merely asserting the perfection of the Uthmanic tradition proves nothing. The realities of the variant traditions must be embraced and examined before the Quran can be proven to have been accurately transmitted. What you need, my friends, is a critical edition of the Quran. Now, for many of you sitting here, you look at our Bibles, and you look at those footnotes, or you look at the UBS 4th edition over there, and he holds it up and says, see all this stuff? These are the variations. And I go, thank God I have that. Because that means no one has been able to get in there and, and totally change this and fool me. I want that information. And we're wide open about it. Where is your critical Quran? I'm not talking about the, the seven aruf. I'm not talking about that. Where is your critical Quran? Now, there's a, there's a project right now, right now called the Corpus Quranicum. But it's primarily Western scholars that are working on it. And there are a lot of people in the Muslim world, they don't support doing that. We don't need to have a critical edition of the Quran. We don't need to be telling people there was a variation at Surah 2, 222. I want to know that. 